Thank you, uh, Manoj. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you uh, for uh, inviting me because uh, academic community, including students and colleagues, had been integral part of my life throughout, from student days. And it's always nice to reconnect. Because now, as Kavita has pointed out, I'm retired. And uh, so, I've been able to kind of connect with uh, people and students community through internet. That was an advantage in a way that COVID has indirectly has given us. So I was able to kind of uh, continue my uh, teaching, even prepare new uh, lessons for uh, this uh, art history batch that I uh, conducted two different sessions. So I already recognize many of you. ഇംഗ്ലീഷിൽ <laughs> സംശയം ഉണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അത് മാറ്റാം സോ യാ സോ ഐ എം ഓൾറെഡി കണക്റ്റഡ് ആസ് എ ആസ് എ ഫാക്കൽറ്റി മെമ്പർ ടു ദിസ് ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൾവേസ് വെരി ഗുഡ് കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് കണക്ട് ടു ദ ലാർജർ സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് കമ്മ്യൂണിറ്റി ഹിയർ നോ ഐ വോണ്ട് ടു ഓൾസോ സേ സം words with regard to what kavita has said and also manuj has uh, said i don't think uh, students should be overwhelmed by all that you know <laughs> it is like if you narrate your life there would be a lot of such things you know mm. uh, so you shouldn't feel i mean i was thinking more about my art historical um, you know things you know that kavita has narrated of course the political position that one took was inevitable i will do that any time even after many lives that is inscribed in your soul you know that's your soul trying to kind of do something i'm not saying that body and soul are separate things or something but uh, that's part of your inner be you know so there's no no pretensions there but uh, the academic uh, things that i have achieved in life have been very hard earned it has never came very natural to me so when my very close friend uh, who was with me in baroda we reached baroda at the same year 1976 uh, he knew me he knows very well that very well that i was not equipped in any way to to do art history or even do art somehow karangi tirinja engu vettatha kondu kalayil etti pinne adil endengil aavanulla shramam aa shramam bhayangara guru var shramichitta ayadu and it's nothing is naturally gifted that's it. i'm not a naturally gifted art historian nor an artist i did not become an artist is another thing i went there to learn art basically then there was one professor ratan parimu it's nice to remember him in the beginning because uh, it was he who wrote me in because i already had a mba in economics from in kerala university so he was looking around for students who could do mma art history in baroda that was initial years of post graduation in art history in baroda 
it was started in 1974 or so and i was there in 1976 and i was he managed to rope me in that in 1977 so i did the, that ma for three years like that so it was a great struggle to become something in life i did not know language i didn't know english i didn't know malayalam i used to read <laughs> things like novel or something but uh, as not uh, theoretically or conceptually or knowledge wise in any in, because i had a very very um upbringing that was in the school that was in a very far fetched village in kutanad in kawala of course i had a lot of cultural capital with me because my family was very much into uh, all that reading and culture and theater and you know all that but uh, i didn't have uh, the basic educational skills Edu- because that was a kind of village school that i studied and anyway so i don't want to kind of go too much into my um, autobiography here that's not the purpose of uh, i'm only kind of adding that to manoj uh, and uh, and kavita that uh, whatever has happened in life in academic thing nothing was god gifted it was all hard It was all result of hard work. I remember I used to buy nails if I had to write something. I mean, I PhD, whole PhD I wrote with so much of uh, struggle. So even now, I feel not too too comfortable with my articulation. So, because that fire of wanting to become, you know. if you kindle that if you promote that i think that's the right thing to tell the students community you know you should not feel in any way uh, you know lacking anything you must recognize your lacks but you should struggle to overcome them i mean life is always you know uh, 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 a process of want having overcome you know to to overcome limitation so uh knowledge that way is uh, very hard earned knowledge do not come <coughs> very natural to to academies academ- academics that way i'm not talking about common sense knowledge so common sense kind of knowledge i'm also not under uh, valuing the uneducated in that sense but those who study and learn you know it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, struggle so i dedicate my uh, these lectures six eight lectures which are scheduled to the <coughs> students who are you know still struggling struggling a lot to kind of grapple with their surroundings their life their uh, work you know and what they want to become in life so to that spirit of having to grow need to grow i am kind of dedicating my presentation and in this process i am not claiming that i know a lot uh my knowledge i will share with you i know that i don't have too much uh, of everything you know that i must know but we can always discuss and we can always grow together that's the spirit that in which i speak Uh, uh, today, so uh, um, I'm actually going to <clears throat> focus on uh, in the coming three lectures, including today. I'm going to talk about modern Western <clears throat> Euro-American developments in art. So, uh, and the next two lectures after the three lectures, we I'm going to focus on India. i'm not talk- talking about south asia but i am talking specifically of the national geographical boundary called india uh because many uh, american scholars or european scholars would want to kind of talk about south asia you know uh, as a geopolitical uh, area but we i'd been trained as to kind of look at the national national as a frame so euro american as well as national so it's a kind of a kind of a juxtaposing of these two 
So that will cover the five uh, lectures that I have. And the sixth one is still open, but one is uh, titled is, as Curiophobia, if uh, we are interested. But some people have suggested that eighth being a, a women's day, there should be something about women liberation. Uh, we can reconsider that. But uh, queer liberation is equally important, I would say. So uh, it's about liberation. So uh, we can. So today's presentation, I'm going to focus largely on uh, the introductory aspect of uh, my. Uh, uh, why I'm calling it limits of modern art is because I don't consider any artist or any art movement or any artism or any particular phase is complete by itself or total in itself or infallible or in itself. Everything has limits that is under this uh, uh, sun. So modern art had set certain goals, but it has faced its own crisis. So that is the theme of the uh, uh, presentation, that where do you actually locate the limit of modern art? You know, how do you see the, read the limits that, of course, we are always asked to read the great contribution of Cubism or great contribution of uh, so-and-so artists. Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, we need to know that. But then after doing that, you should also know what they are not able to do. So I think there is a, there is in that sense I'm using limit. This word limit probably we will explain it further as we go ahead. But uh, basically I'm uh, trying to define the conceptual aspect or how do we understand modernism, how do we understand postmodernism or certain theoretical premises are important to, to understand when we talk about uh, Yeah, so first of all, we, we consider that, uh, sorry, actually this slide is, yeah, so I'm actually going to talk to you that modernism has already become a tradition. So there is a formulation nowadays we see that modernist tradition. So the moment you see tradition, it becomes a, it, it means that there is a convention, it is a, Industry, I mean, using, I'm jumping actually and saying that art is an industry today in the modern world, in the, con in the contemporary capitalist world. Art becomes like film industry, music industry, fine art industry, visual art industry, right? So we should not sh shy away from that uh, reality. I mean, because there is a lot of aura that is associated with uh, I know, being an artist, being a, 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 a looking at art, the very active. Uh, so uh, uh, modern art has actually become an industry. I will explain it further. But when you say avant-garde, or when you say deviant or non-conformist, rebellious or uh, or radical. It always means that, that, that you are against some grain, some, something that is uh, status quo or established values, right? So, uh, uh, so I'm actually kind of bringing in these two colliding things, these two different things into the, into the framework so that uh, uh, we get a real good critical perspective about modern and postmodern art. Now, next point that I'm going to bring to you is that modernism or modernist, modernism or postmodernism are used in terms of uh, time frame. When you say modern period, that you definitely have a frame of time in, in front of you that it starts somewhere and it goes to some place, time. So it starts somewhere in the late 17th century or early 18th, sorry, uh, late 18th century or uh, early 19th century through 20th century, it moves, you know, in terms of various uh, movements. 
So modernism as a as a as a time frame, it is not Renaissance. You know, some scholars trace it back to Renaissance. Fine, we can accept that the pre prototype of some kind of uh, modernism existed in Renaissance. But when you say modern period, that means actually the uh, early 19th century through 20th century. And uh, what and when is that modernism or when is that postmodernism? Is a matter of time frame that you give. Say, for instance, when I'm saying postmodern, it's always counted post in the post 60s, post 1960s. So you can either look at it, sorry, from the point of view of uh, time frame, or you can look at it from the point of view of uh, experience, historical experience point of view, or as a value. Like, um, modernism had been a critically different period. Modern period had been critically different because it challenged all that was established in the pre-modern conventions in terms of politics, in terms of material production, in terms of social relations, in terms of uh, consumer behavior, in terms of art forms, in all sense, modern period actually uh, uh, had been a different experiential value. So modernism is a historical value uh, in terms of a time frame. Modernism is a historical experience in terms of experience. So these two distinctions we need to kind of keep in mind. Now. I want to say that the long history of modernism that uh, we have gone through uh, uh, from early 19th century onwards has come to, I, I want to kind of look at modernism from the point of view of 60s or 1960s or 1970s with a retrospective view. If you are looking back at the time, it was pointed out that modern Ism has come to a kind of, or modern art in specific terms has come to a, come to a crisis. Now I'll explain this crisis, why this is called a crisis. Because modernity as a deeply problematic proposition, that which looked very bright, very, very avant-garde, very progressive, very revolutionary, some 90 years back or 60 years back, in the 60s, 1960s came to be <coughs> judged as problematic and as a thing of crisis. Now, it is said that modernity is something which is just become very dominant as a cultural form. That's why I call it tradition. That's why you call it tradition. It has established itself but it is dominant but dead. This is uh, uh, a quote from Jürgen uh, Habermas, and uh, I'll explain it further. It has failed. Why it has failed is a question. How it has failed is a question, but as a tradition it has won. That's why I called modernism as a tradition modernist tradition, but it has failed in terms of, uh, it has become status quo, it was established, it was accepted. All its revolutionary you know, ideas of uh, uh, pro, uh, kind of challenge that had thrown over to the uh, capitalist world it was already absorbed and museumized and kind of practiced, so it became uh, a tradition. But it's winning, it won, but it's winning is as good as its defeat, because it was completely now become ossified, completely now became so status quoist, in the sense too established and too dominant, that it is of not used to the people who want to kind of uh, 
renew themselves or express something or something you know more you have to say you know so it had to be reinvented modernism had to be so its original uh, oppositional modernism became largely absorbed and official that is the thing you know that in uh, uh, 1916 if marcel duchamp did the urinal you know put it on a pedestal and exhibited but in 10 years time it became a collector's item the museum became uh, hunting the original piece where he signed mat no so this is actually kind of uh, 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 an absorption it was already established and became official so as i said that uh, uh, going back actually this was one one starting point that modernity is absorbed modernity is dead its uh, 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 its its success is almost like its failure so uh, uh, now going back defining modernity in art how do you define modernity in art despite the fact that it has failed we as we as art students must know what what is what is it you know what what is that makes it uh, modern or what is it how is it different from the pre modern now as we know that uh, modernity is traced back to the uh, to 19th century french art and criticism it is also uh, modernism in art is also an invention of art critics art critics actually played a very very significant role in mid 19th century to argue for the value of art along with the impressionists and the realists and the post impressionists the writers were in arms you know uh, arguing for the uh, value of modernism so uh, uh, it also seems uh, that modernism was uh, an experience uh, not only in visual art but also in literature music even in politics you know so many new experimentations came in revolutionary political movements like democracy uh, communism socialism now having said that when we say that it is all kind of positive value that it has asserted we also need to contrast modern in terms of its negativity in terms of generating things like two world wars first and second world war and uh, nazism fascism and anarchy so that is also part of history modern history right so uh, uh, when the moment you say that has great achievement in terms of uh, art music uh, culture etc it has also got a lot to do and politically also you talk about democracy and equality and uh, liberty but you saw you also talk about the kind of negative it in terms of uh, totalitarianism that was coming up uh, in terms of even communism got corrupt you know uh, in the stalinist uh, russia we know it so uh, that is one aspect of it now one common uh, minimum uh, uh, value that is attributed to modernism is that it challenged all that was established it questioned all that was established in the victorian period including neoclassicism in art right a certain um, prudent uh, a certain uh, uh, acceptable kind of social etiquette and norms you know or what art should be what uh, uh, how beautiful art should be uh, what should uh, what should be the theme of art kind of a established uh, mend of the naturalism and uh, 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 and particular kind of genre or themes that you find in especially say the glorification of nude women for instance you know is one example of that kind of victorian uh, values whereas modernism is uh, is about self reflexivity 
One, another very important aspect that comes to modernism is the individualism that we have not seen a precedence of. That subjectivity of the artist. When you say subjectivity, it is we are talking about the agency of the individual. That the individual's right to go into one's own psychology or social uh, psychology or subjective states, the moods, the emotions. Nowhere actually, when you say individualism, and when you say radical subjective position, the agency uh, of that individual is always kind of uh, reflective of the states, uh, the emotional states of that uh, individual. So uh, no other time in, in the history, entire history of human uh, being that you've come across this, uh, you know, heightened sense of individual freedom. But for, for in the modernist period. <clears throat> now, modernism also rejects uh, naturalism or realism. <clears throat> that kind of uh, uh, out there, real representation. <clears throat> or what you call as objective uh, representation, objective realism. Now, realism ha is a very dif difficult word as such, but realism is used in various contexts, also by realists, by Kurbe, etc. Uh, in the first half of 19th century. I'm not talking about that realism now, but something very ultimate faith in <clears throat> a real world, like what you actually get to see from Renaissance, High Renaissance onwards. Michelangelo, Leonardo, they have a kind of a worldview that is <clears throat> so absolutely uh, uh, believable. You know? It's like that. It's kind of one perspective and you see it through a kind of a, a perspectival space and there is a kind of complete fallibility of that, complete belief in that kind of realism. It is that which got completely ruffled, completely denied or rejected. Now, alternative ways of thinking about representation came about in, in, in uh, 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 modernism, radical experimentations in form happened. One example is Cubism. The Marcelli de Avignon of 1907 by Picasso is a <coughs> leap in terms of formal experimentation. Also Matisse in the early 20th century. And many other artists, everybody, all uh, who were involved, they are always thinking in terms of how to come to a kind of a new representation of uh, of life of, in art. They 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 resorted to fragmentation of form. Uh, cubism is again very good example of that. Sometimes you find great ambiguity in that uh, uh, shuffling of human representation. Say if you see, take synthetic cubism of, uh, or uh, 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 analytical cubism, or even Matisse's uh, representation of, uh, you know, scenery, etc. You find, you, you don't know what is foreground and middle ground and background. There's a kind of a kind of a, uh, a mix up of all that. Now, in all these developments, you, you, you see that uh, the idea of avant-garde, it's a French term, which meaning who, who are in the forefront in the warfare, who are in the, are in the war forefront are called avant-garde, vanguard. Uh, so that very same term is used in the context of uh, uh, modern art, and cultural activists, and they use they claimed themselves to be avant-garde and it uh, refers primarily to the works of those artists whose work is opposed to the mainstream Victorian neoclassical uh, cultural values and who had actually an established uh, political and social values, so religious also uh, values. So here we have uh, a kind of a barrage, a, a great you know, tsunami of uh, 
challenges that was thrown against the so those who actually in the forefront on the fountain head lot of it you may not actually find it today very revolutionary for instance the basal lidi avignon avignon uh, women of avignon you know, of 2007 if you don't know you must refer and see that today we may not find it very 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 difficult to accept because it is a modernist work now in picasso's time he did not show it for almost 25 years to anybody it was kind of hidden in a studio because it was completely unacceptable i'm not I'm not going into the details it's up to you to kind of find out what is the revolutionary thing that you find in um, uh, so uh, all these put together those who actually challenged the establishment came to be called as avant-garde so there is all of so also a russian avant-garde please uh, take note of that french avant-garde italian avant-garde all these various our german avant-garde too german expressionist avant-garde so all these actually come form a kind of a larger history of modern art that we talk about so my interest is actually not going into any descriptive understanding giving any descriptive uh, knowledge about any of these movements but i'm referring to this for your understanding and for your reference you should refer to it and study yourself also apart from your classroom <clears throat> so modern uh, uh, art actually generally brought the oppositional uh, values to the conventions as i pointed out already anti establishment subversive and transgressive they were they were kind of completely kind of rejecting the establishment the established values visual values and kind of crossing over and trying to establish something new at times it also questioned itself it as an art as an institution itself that's why it is called autocritical like in the case of the uh, exceptional movements within uh, modern art is uh, raised by uh, dadaism and surrealism particularly these are two movements that were somewhat not so clearly gelling with in with the flow of modern modern art they stand out like you know some kind of uh, very glaring kind of uh, uh, incidents in the history of art uh, because these are uh, 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 talking about self destructiveness it talks about uh, uh, anti art art against art itself so you don't actually do art so uh, so unlike cubism and uh, they are still working with the given plastic values to use the form color uh, shape line etc etc you know the given values of art but it was dadaism uh, that actually challenged all those uh, established things uh, that was acceptable in art so it was one of the most radical uh, um, uh, movements now as i already pointed out modern art had been individualistic experimental i'm just listing up some of these key terms that would be useful for you subversive or transgressive they were always challenging the establishment they could be obscure in the sense always the artist need not tell you what what why he or she has made something right because this a lot of things were personal uh and so some examples like dance by matisse what is it you know who's dance why they dance you know so it can actually get into a kind of obscurity like cesar's apples for instance you know uh so so many things could be exclusive and esoteric all these words would apply there because everything is not self explanatory in modern art so that's also one reason that people kept out of it or people developed a certain mistrust about uh, people at large i mean uh, <clears throat> it could also look like a fashion of fad you know that it was not very serious uh, 
uh, in its uh, you know approach like the, the the performances in switzerland in the second in the first world war looked very anarchic and kind of um, like a, like a, any kind of mad thing you know so <clears throat> But it could also claim social political commitment, like Picasso's uh, Guernica or the whole of uh, Mexican mural. It could evoke that kind of social realism kind of thing. In, even in India, we have Somna Thor and others, right? So uh, a kind of a social, socially oriented art. The so socialist art is one. So. Or modernism could actually kind of uh, 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 come to that too. It definitely rejected the past, but at the same time, it could also reclaim the present. Sorry, it, it could also reclaim the past. On one hand, it rejected the past, but it could also take something from it. Picasso is a very good example. He used to copy Go Goya and others. No, he, here also you find actually a kind of a similarity with postmodernism, like Dadaism, yeah, and also imitation. So, modernists, all modernists were not averse to the past in that sense. They always kind of somehow looked at the past, like in, in the case of Picasso. So. <clears throat> now, I will come to the difference between the postmodernist and the modernist slightly later. <clears throat> Uh, one of the aspects of modernism is that they always claimed originality. Now, this was very one very, very tough question that uh, everybody faced in the modernist phase. Because nobody wanted to be imitative. And the moment you somebody pointed out that your work is like somebody, somebody's, then they all kind of said, no, it's not like that. You know? So there was a lot of fear about being not origin, being not being original. So, uh, uh, so that was one one claim that modernists were always making. I would, so that's also the reason that each movement that you find in modernism kind of uh, goes over the other, more than the other. Like if uh, realism said something, the impressionism kind of went beyond. If Impressionism said something, pointillism went a little more, you know. So the artists like Goga and Van Gogh even went further in terms of expression, you know, in terms of analysis of. But this Fauvism went further in terms of color liberation. Because so, so everything grew from one to the other. There was a certain, certain, uh, certain sense of connectivity and progress in that, you know. So in any case, they were all kind of trying to be unconventional. So <clears throat> irreverence was one aspect of it, but sometimes you also find reverence like Matisse's very late drawings by him, you know. There is a very outright celebration of se sensuality in uh, Matisse, you know. There's a kind of an oriental um, uh, kind of uh, uh, sensuality. Of, uh, of, uh, of a harem or something like very pleasurable a garden like you know quality in uh, celebrativeness in Matisse's early work but that that hedonistic tendency gives way to more uh, religious kind of thing in his very late works uh, so so irreverent definitely but also very um, at times very rarely it gets into anarchy of course uh, uh, that you find in the case of dadaism self destructive some of the dadais were so extreme dadais that they lost life they jumped into sea or uh, uh, they, they kind of committed suicide. Uh, so Dadaist philosophy or kind of approach had been very, very, uh, very, very self-destructive in the real sense. But once you don't exist, then you can't actually see what, uh, what is the impact of what you do. So uh, it kind of did, led to that kind of nihilism and that kind of anarchy. Uh, one 
point that need to be kept in mind that uh, modernist art is definitely an expression of the repressed human mind, I would suggest. Because Renaissance tried to kind of control you, con you know, coordinate you into a kind of a worldview, very religious belief in a God, there is a kind of oneness about everything. It's kind of very feudal in, in its approach, right? Even High Renaissance has that triangular, sorry, triangular kind of uh, shape also in its composition. Whereas, uh, so as a result, individualism of modernism allowed, unleashed that kind of freedom, you know? It kind of liberational in many ways. So a lot of repressed uh, feelings are inscribed in modernist art. So there's a whole lot of study from the psychological point of view uh, of, say, for instance, Cezanne's apples, you know, or uh, Picasso's uh, distortions, or Picasso's, uh, you know, women representations. Straightway, if you come to surrealism, it is all about repression. <laughs> It's all about configuring, you know, psyche and the kind of subconscious mind. No, so in that sense, it is rebellious. Rebellious. It was revolutionary. So it was. Uh, uh, it was all that. It was uh, kind of a modernist tradition. Now you can understand, perhaps. And each place modernism went it created its own kind of version. That is also very important. That French modernism is not the same as the British modernism. The German modernism is different. So also Indian modernism is very different. Uh, historically, it is very different. Now, it is um, one of the themes of uh, modern art is that it was the tendency, if you analyze from a retrospect, you see that the tendency was to do away with figuration. Now, that th this tendency you see progressively coming to Mondria, Malevich, to Kandinsky in the first two, two decades, that they wanted to kind of be abstract in terms of with colors represent sound, music, etc., etc., or pure uh, shapes like vertical and horizontal in the case of Mondrian. So uh, that sense of uh, doing away with narration, which was a very central theme of uh, pre-modern art uh, anywhere in the world. Narration had been very central, but modernism kind of uh, evacuates human figure, tries to kind of do away with reference to the human uh, presence or landscape or uh, anything that, that is recognizable. Now, it is only in the 60s that this aspect of modernism is recognized and articulated. It is by Clement Greenberg, this American um, uh, uh, art historian critic, who set the, set the ultimate value of art to be pure and autonomous non-referential, autonomous when you say it has no reference to outside world. It will be complete in itself. It need not refer anything outside itself. So a complete purity. You may remember a, a, an artist like Rothko. Even it crosses uh, Jackson Pollock, who were into action painting that was more psychological outpouring of the kind of surrealist kind of uh, basis. But pure uh, uh, abstraction we come across in the time of minimalists. One thing, and it is that time that Clement Green, Greenberg, it's a height of modernism. You couldn't actually go. Color field abstraction. You know, just red or just a color. Um, which has no reference. Unlike the earlier modernists like uh, Mondrian or Kandinsky, 
who referred to music or landscape or some structure, etc., etc. At the t by the time you come to the minimalists, there is complete absence of any reference. There is it's not representing anything. It's non-representational, then complete. So it is uh, Clement Greenberg who defined modernity as modernity in art as a as an aesthetic field. It's an aesthetic uh, perspective. Uh, so he places uh, uh, minimal art uh, as the highest achievement. Now, where do you go from there? It, it, it is a crisis. I mean, a movement comes to a kind of a end. I mean, you can imagine that after after minimalism, you also experiment op, you know, op, optical illusion in art. That is also kind of experimented. Then where do you go from there? Now, it's very important to take note of the fact that entire history of modern art through 19th century and 20th century, until pop art came into existence, there was a kind of discrediting of the imagination of the masses, of visual culture, what we call as the visual culture of the people. The mass art, what Germans called as kitsch, or the bad taste, it means that if high art is actually pure taste, the, the art that was enjoyed by the common man was considered to be kitsch, or bad taste and so there is a discontinuity of that notion of purity of Greenberg and a kind of a new rebellion came from in the form of pop art. Pop art is our subject for tomorrow. I will not uh, elaborate more about it today. But pop art actually is seen as a kind of a break away from the kind of puritanical modernist uh, aesthetics. And uh, it's, uh, it, it is also the first time that uh, rather than the internal aesthetic value that is attributed in a work of art by the modernist, the structuralist principle of appreciation of a work of art is that every meaning is within the artwork, considered to be within the artwork. Whereas the uh, Pope, Pope movement actually gave rise to a possibility that you could think about the meaning from the context it belonged. That what gave something that value, the context of it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Pope art actually enabled this kind of uh, interpretation of uh, or a post-structuralist method of uh, interpretation that the meaning of a work of art do not lie within it, but it depends on the framework that you see from which you see from outside. Now, I want to leave that there. We will pick it up some other time, tomorrow perhaps. But I want to kind of point uh, my fingers at uh, certain other aspects of uh, what is called as postmodern art now. Now, it is a fact that today's art is very, very alarmingly uh, uh, heterogeneous. It's confusing. There is no progression. There is no cubism leading to something else. There is no impressionism that is leading to something else. But everything exists simultaneously. There is also that lack of faith in a kind of a group that was constructed by a style, like cubism style or Matthesis, Fauvism style or something like that, you know. So style as a, as a category of uh, bringing together artists uh, ceased to be existing today, that you are coming into a period of uh, perplexingly 
complex, uh, <clears throat> confusing situation, you find <clears throat> profusion of styles, forms, practices, <clears throat> and agendas. Now, today, we are not very certain as what we call as art. If I say that drinking this water in this way is performance, it actually kind of breaks that uh, slight barrier between actually drinking my water and calling it as performance. So a very thin line that exists between art and non-art in this context. So the category art itself is less certain uh, from the traditional point of view. Traditional point of view is that object should be art, object should have this kind of color combination, this kind of movement, this kind of proportion, this kind of all those stipulated uh, uh, norms of aesthetics have been completely challenged and completely e eradicated. We, today we see uh, uh, not only unconventional materials, but also use of things like air. You si find light, sound, words. You find actual people performing in the, in the gallery or outside. You can cook and make art, serve food and art even. So even mon mundane activities like walking, giving a lecture, you know, could be also kind of uh, called as an art. Walking, shaking hand, hugging, cutting the cloth, planting a tree. Yeah, so, so the kind of definition of art has unimaginably kind of uh, grown. Now we, we call it uh, from minimal art, you came to a kind of a conceptual art, or concept art. We'll come to that uh, tomorrow. Then what we call as new media art, you know, starting with photography in the 18th century to uh, onwards, you have video art, still camera, you have uh, camera itself has various, uh, you know, transformation, the image making, and uh, of all we have the virtual platform, the internet, and the kind of uh, thing that you find new media art. We hope to kind of have a greater understanding of that in the days to come. There is also a book going to be uh, published from here. So in that there is a going to be, I suppose there is a person who is going to be a specialist in um, new media. Uh, so anyway, as I pointed out, we have body art, we have performance art, we have of course installation. Uh, endless are uh, those uh, nomenclatures and uh, names, you know, uh, what we can call as uh, uh, interactive art. Uh, <coughs> So, hardly anything that is uh, uh, called as established materials, techniques, and methods. Now, you may be wondering, sitting in an art school studying painting and sculpture, where are you? <laughs> but you should think about it, really. I'm not pushing you to do new art, new medium art, but uh, I think we'll have opportunity to talk about the Indian education, art educational system, right? So at some point, so where are we stuck up? Why are our institutions not revising our courses, programs as per the art development? What you see in Binale is different from what you actually practice in the studios. There's a lot of difference uh, that there's a, there's, a, there's a space gap between these two. Right? So, the, what the so-called advanced art or avant-garde art of today, uh, somehow we still do, we feel that we are lagging behind? Perhaps, or perhaps not, I don't know. These are questions that needs to engage us. 
Well, uh, today's art is also including process art. That is, a process of doing something would be called as art. Uh, so, <clears throat> so now I'm not actually in my lectures. I'm not going to describe all these. I'm not going to get into all this, but. My concern is largely the beginning of contemporary, the formation of the contemporary. So 60s and 70s is the time that I would like to kind of focus on in the coming days. Pop art is one. Neo Dada or conceptual art is one. They are alternatively called as uh, Neo Dada assemblages or, or concept art. Then you have a movement called Art Povera that is Italian art povera, uh, art and poverty, you know. So environmental art, something like um, Joseph Bias, uh, body art, performance art, more specifically political art. Now the understanding of political art itself has changed in 60s and 70s. We will come to that definitely. Uh, what we call as feminist art, we will call as uh, Dalit art, uh, queer art, etc., etc., are politically edged. So all those great uh, class war and you know proletarian and uh, war between the capitalists is somewhat now taken over by more smaller uh, issues like subjectivity, women issues or sexuality issues, etc., etc. So that is also one aspect of postmodern time. Now, a critique of pop art, I said pop art stands at a, at a juncture, a very important juncture of a break from modernism to the postmodernism. But pop art itself was highly questionable. So a lot of people rejected, who followed, who came up in 70s. And a lot of art collectives came into existence, not unlike the earlier art collectives, art movements. They are more correctly called as art movements and leaders or participants of those movements. But uh, these are art collectives where uh, uh, art workers collect co uh, co uh, co uh, coalition is one. You have Joseph Bias, no Nam June Pike. Yoko Ono, New Expressionism in Germany, uh, Italian trans avant-garde. These are all loosely, loosely, loosely uh, called as uh, collectives. Uh, New Expressionism in France and America. All these are kind of different, uh, larger, um, you know, collectives. You can say, but. Uh, one of the most important uh, questions that came up in the 70s, 60s and down is the politics of identity. World over, you find today, we are also having identity issues that, like the Dalit issue and Dalit expression in art. These are kind of new, new categories that has come up in the last 10 years or 15 years or even maybe maximum 20 years or so. We have something like a Dalit voice today, women and uh, identity. So where actually the cultural and the personal uh, individuals uh, person became central to much of the art of the post 1970s. So you talk greatly more about the radical subjective positions of today. Now, <clears throat> that's more about today's introduction to uh, art development in the modern and postmodern period. Uh, but I would like to uh, end the uh, presentation. I have still more time. Uh, we should also keep some time for discussion, right? So uh, I would like to kind of enter into a quick uh, uh, reading of some of the post definitions of what postmodernism entails. Now, we have already mentioned that uh, modernism is um, defined as a project that is, that, uh, uh, that is already won but uh, failed but won, right? Um, uh, winning is as good as its defeat is what uh, we have already pointed out. So, I have already pointed out 
So I'm just reiterating that uh, uh, the original oppositional modernism is largely absorbed and has become official because they have become official and uh, to put it more clearly that they have academicized. They have become part of the art teaching. How to make a cubist painting, how to make an expressionist painting is a kind of a formula. It was I, particularly in a kind of an Indian situation. You know, world over it is perhaps like that also. But here, right from the inception of modernism, this is how it had been. <coughs> we'll come to that when we discuss Indian modernism. So artists in the uh, 20th, uh, sorry, in the, uh, of course, since 1960s have re-examined modernist avant-garde of early 20th century and have reinterpreted them. That is a fact. Uh, Postmodernists were not ready to kind of uh, forego the achievements of modernism. Postmodernists wanted to kind of rework on the modernist uh, 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 achievements. So, postmodernism is defined as an attempt in exceeding modernism itself, the dead end of modernism, of puritanical understanding of definition of modernism. Uh, this is the aspect of uh, uh, most of the art since uh, 1960s. That is, attempt is actually to kind of go beyond the period of progress. Progress beyond the era of progress. Uh, or transgression beyond the idea of transgressive or avant-garde. You know, this is actually Hal Foster who points out the nature of uh, 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 postmodernism as a attempt in transgressing the transgressive. You know? That's why the word postmodernism is also very, you know, the post of the modern, you know, uh, in that sense. So postmodernism as a break from the aesthetic field of modernism. So uh, postmodernism as a challenge towards the, the, um, the puritanical notion of modernism. This is a view by Rosalind Krauss and Douglas Grimm. Uh, these are theoreticians uh, post who, who defines postmodernism. Uh, so I'm just kind of very briefly kind of bringing them here. So some uh, authors like Edward Said and Gregory Ulmer would also interpret postmodernism as a new mode of interpreting art. That a meaning just did not lie within the art, which I have already pointed out, but it is in the context that uh, art become. But this, ex this, this definition actually extends itself that meaning of a work of art is produced at the time the viewer looks at it. It's not actually the given meaning by the artist that is important, but it is the meaning, changing meaning. It's not that everybody, every generation looks at art in the same way. So the interpretations change. If a feminist look at a particular work of art, the meaning would alter, right? So there is no static sense of finality about meaning about work of art. And no artist is attributed or given that power, that authority. That's what is very famously called as death of the author. Very, very, I'm putting it very, very simply for you to understand. Because the death of the author is not actually the death in that sense. But you overlook the, 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 the claim of the author. And you actually bring in from your framework. The framework is very important in new art history, you know, or new criticism, you know, post-structuralist criticism, feminist criticism, or LGBT criticism, uh, Dalit criticism. So they, the, each one of these are frameworks from which you can look at. So this actually shift happened in the postmodern time. And so postmodernism is attributed with this possibility for uh, 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 greater uh, freedom in interpretation, going beyond the claim of the author, right? Now, uh, uh, postmodernism is also considered as schizophrenic. It's a psychological disease, right? 
I, I'm not quite happy with that uh, uh, usage, but uh, definitely there is a theoretical implication of saying it. It's not in the literal sense. How to creatively use your schizophrenia is the question. Mm -hmm. That's what artists do. That's what I, I, art historian can do. Nobody is beyond schizophrenia. <laughs> So, but whoever can use that schizophrenia in a most effective way expresses much more. Okay, so uh, it's Frederick Jameson and Bordelard holds to this view of uh, schizophrenic mode of uh, space and time. Uh, <clears throat> so, postmodernism is also kind of considered as the rise and fall of modern myths of progress and mastery. This is by um, Craig Owens and Kenneth uh, Frampton. Mm -hmm. So various scholars have opinioned various things about uh, uh, postmodernism in defining, in the process of defining as to what this postmodernism is. In any case, like Adorno says, the neo-Marxist critic uh, in aesthetic theory says, that I quote here, today it goes without saying that Nothing concerning art goes without saying, much less without thinking, in the sense that you have to talk about art. You have to speak about art, that nothing is self-evident in art. It's only a kind of cultural historian or an art historian of a, of a new variety. You, I mean, if you're going to search for iconography in modern art or postmodern art, then you may fail. They may, there is no iconography, maybe you like to say. You know? But there's a whole possibility of new interpretations that are forced possible. So, uh, so that's why new art history is also interpretative in its nature. So nothing goes, nothing is obvious in art today that everything needs to be talked about or discussed or written about, spoken about. <coughs> Now, I've already pointed out to you <clears throat> the critical perspective of postmodern uh, so post art begins with post pop art because it criticizes the hybro or the elite uh, modernism. Uh, <clears throat> so, I've already pointed out about the question of po po politics and identity, both cultural and personal, becomes central to much of the post 70s art. Now this is very, uh, uh, very crucial for, as I said, uh, uh, feminists and others. You know, uh, also marginalities of all kinds, or post-coloniality in our case. So it is only from the point of view of the post-colonial subject that we can speak to the West. So that is a political position. So that is why subjectivity, as such, is a very important. Uh, Thing. Now, there is a new freedom that has come. So, on, on one hand, the 60s uh, Greenbergian sense was an end in itself. That was a complete closure uh, of purity. But postmodernism kind of flourished because it challenged, not only challenged high art, but also low materials, materials of ephemeral nature, you know, of no value, hair, you know, anything. Came to be kind of, there was a kind of very, very classical modernist uh, importance for permanence, like metal or steel as well as sculpture is concerned, or, a, you know, a wood or something like that, you know. That could be always there. But today, sculpture is actually water maybe, maybe something that is uh, mm, mm, ephemeral, very, very <clears throat> unpredictable. So I've already pointed out that originality is not a question, but then what is the question then? Because a lot of modern art, uh, sorry, postmodern art is also about combinations and combina uh, combines and combinations, putting together a collage as a mode you know, 
a modernist invention of collage has been used to the maximum extent today to bring in fragments to speak. You, what you can lay claims on only fragments, archaeologically speaking, nothing is intact. Tomorrow, yesterday is gone and yesterday is not in our hand, right? To, to rebuild, to, to bring back that memory, today is only break, broken something, words, some memories, some photographs, something. So the combination of these fragments become uh, a valid proposition. In. So collaging, colliding, it becomes a very important uh, method in postmodern art. Now, <clears throat> postmodern also, very importantly, which I will discuss more elaborately tomorrow, do not anymore believe in that kind of given reality. A pre-given reality. God has created a world. We don't believe that. It's not that God has not created. But we be don't believe in a kind of a world that is tangible, that is real. Because world is, as, is considered as a simulacrum. That word conceptualization called simulacrum is a very, very helpful terminology which we will discuss tomorrow. Um, that it is an alternative. Every representation is another reality. It is not a copy of another a reality. Like Plato said that art is a mirror held against nature, right? So a kind of authenticity and fall fallibility was there in the representation. What I am showing is the real including photography, if it claims, it's false. So, uh, it is simulacral. Uh, is, the, is the concept that I would be uh, focusing in the context of pop art, uh, particularly. Now, today, artists are quoting. Instead of uh, talking about imitation, people are, artists are saying, we are quoting. And the quoting itself has many uh, many forms of quoting. One is copying, that you can literally copy something from something. You can do a pastiche, a kind of a quality. Uh, you can give up, give, give up the quality, qualitative value, and kind of make it a, a very trivial or frivolous kind of, uh, uh, so pastiche is a method, ironic representation or references, referencing. Imitation is one, another, uh, duplication, etc., etc. Now we saw a, a duplication of uh, kind, so, sort in, 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 in this, uh, and suddenly comes to my mind, in the uh, uh, LFP, you know, Logameda Ravado, of that uh, Jitish Kalat. What kind of, uh, Imitating oneself, duplicating is that, you know. So, wherein it's all outsourced, it's all from net or it's all from already existing form or it's already something or the other. So, it's not drawn, it's not created in that sense of the modernist terms. So, there's no claim of originality there. Now, there could be questions regarding that, we will take that up. Uh, so there is also something called new expressionism of the kind. Although feminist critique is very strong with regard to expressionism, uh, also a critique of expressionism from the point of view of a, from a projection of subjectivity over to the, over to the object. Uh, so a new realism of withdrawn realism or a of a kind of a classical realism. In the case of, say, in our case, uh, German, it is German origin, but in the case of, uh, say, um, Sudhir Patwadhan, for instance. So, uh, but despite all that, macho gestural abstraction, abstraction or gestural uh, painting existed throughout contemporary times. So, they are large format and uh, uh, emotional outpouring that happens, you know, in, in the work of art. 
And it is particularly pertinent from the Dalit point of view or the subaltern point of view, because those repressed classes have a right to kind of, you know, expressionistically express themselves, you know. Uh, certain anger comes, certain hatred comes, they have certain, you know, uh, so, uh, so, so, both ways you can actually talk about this neo expressionism. It could also stand for neo fascism. Like in Germany, in kind of all over the world, you find. It could also work in the kind of neo Hindutva uh, uh, hands, you see. A kind of a macho, macho uh, picturization of Rama, for instance. You know, that kind. You never see that in the pre modern times, you know. Uh, Rama, Rama had been always very beautiful, lovable, you know, uh, thing. But today's Rama is like a, you know, uh, all that. So, so uh, there's a quote from Owen um, Reich: "Appropriation, site, site specificity, impermanence." Accumulation. Accumulation means an archive, right? Discursivity meaning that inter interfere. You don't allow one argument, but you bring in a kind of a uh, discursivity. Hybridization. Hybrid has a value. Uh, hybrid means unpure, impure. You know, any claim on purity, purity is today uh, not acceptable because nothing is pure. So any claim on Aryan race and kind of Dravidian culture, etc., is a little problematic because hybridization and crossbreeding had been always uh, the, the principle of culture. These diverse strategies characterize much of the art of the present and distinguishing it from the modernist predecessor. I thought it's a pertinent uh, uh, point to conclude with appropriation. See, one difference is that uh, site specificity, when you say a modern, uh, modern sculpture, unlike the pre modern culture, could be moved around. You could exhibit it anywhere, any gallery. You put it on the pedestal, it belongs there. Whereas a temple or a church sculpture was specifically designed for that site. Right? So, site specificity has come back today. Spiral jetty will be there until it is destroyed, right? So like that, uh, so impermanence and size specificity, uh, etc. Uh, uh, accumulation, discursivity, hybridization, these diverse strategies characterize much of the art of the present and distinguish it from the modernist uh, predecessors. Now, one more distinction I want to make, <clears throat> but I have something more also at the end, sorry. Are you all bored? That's fine. Hmm? That's fine. Sorry. Now, Foster makes a distinction between post-modernism of reaction and post-modernism of resistance. What he calls as uh, postmodernism of reaction is the <coughs> attitude of anything goes, the market driven postmodernism, which are promoted by the media gurus and the, the, the you know, fashion industry and all that. So they can actually pull together anything from the um, past and call it uh, appropriation and postmodern. So anything goes is a kind of a, a, a gesture. Whereas Hal Foster distinguishes critical radical postmodernism, a postmodernism that creates resistance to the to the ongoing, unacceptable. <coughs> postmodernism can be said as an extension of modernist art. Modern so it's a, some art historians can see it as a cultural theorists see it as a continuous that they don't see much break. It's only a kind of a continuation, they see. But uh, some people see, see it as a drastic difference. So there are difference opinion with regard to uh, its continuity. So that distinction also we need to keep in mind. 
So these are various positions with regard to. <coughs> now, I preferred actually Lyotard's definition that it's an aporetic relationship. Aporetic would mean uh, uh, an, a, a very vague relationship. It's not a very clearly distinguishable relationship. Uh, the relation between modernism and postmodernism was intercessive. Intercessive means intersectional and a poetic one. These intersections create, or this crisscrossing actually creates a certain uh, aporia. Aporia would be a certain mental state where you are vague. You are you don't know what is right, what is wrong, how it is. You know. So. Uh, uh, <clears throat> The, the quote is, the postmodern would be that which in the modern put forward the unpresent, represent, unpresentable in presentation itself. So, postmodernism is more self-conscious of itself. It can actually more self-consciously articulate something. Even the crisis can be articulated more clearly by... Postmodernism is also said to be a kind of consciousness. Now, tell me, Rabindranath Tagore has also planted trees. This is my classic example. Uh, John, Joseph Byers also has planted tree. What is the difference between these two? Our sannyasis also do dug up and lie inside. Will they call it body art or earth art? <laughs> no, because. There is a consciousness that entails this. It's not the formal similarities that you should go by. Formal similarities could work in the case of modernist start. But in the postmodern context, it is always the consciousness of the of the doer or the or the or the how do you judge that consciousness is in the consistency of the artist, in the kind of uh, Con con constant. Now, Homi Baba also says that uh, the subtle sophistication of these distinctions, either it is postmodernism of reaction or postmodernism of uh, you know, uh, assertion or uh, postmodernism of celebration or postmodernism as something new and something uh, uh, continuous, continuous, continuation. All the, all the subtle sophistication of such definitions are lost when the term is taken over by the Anglo-American context, by journalists, media gurus, fashion consultants, disc jockeys and advertisement copywriters. So they kind of uh, still actually that, that kind of their, their definitions are rather loose. So we have to be aware of it. I'm not saying actually to kind of keep them out as outsiders or as outcasts, but to be aware of what they are doing is very important. Now, my last point is only this, that for the first time there is a visual <laughs> in a fine art college uh, presentation. I'm very happy here. Uh, this is a tangled age. Jean uh, Tanguli, Swiss painter and sculptor, is an assemblage. I'm showing it uh, not because uh, uh, of uh, any particular reference to this uh, presentation, but to prove some point about art culture, that art has become actually a kind of a possibility that it can destroy itself. It's a, coin, it's a kind of mechanized, self-destructive junk sculpture that this uh, Tinguli has, um, uh, uh, he actually made a, a towering contraction of composed, it was composed of junk, dismembered bicycles, dismantled musical instruments, various things, glass bottles, um, balloons and electric motors, and they were all assembled in a kind of very doubtful combination. And then automatically it, 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 it was installed and spectators were invited to see it. It was a one night only performance for 250 viewers. 
they were also report, uh, reporters and it was held in Abbe Andrick Rockefeller Sculpture Garden at the Museum of Modern Art on 17, March 17 of 1960. And self-destruct, of course it did, but not quite according to the plan of the artist. Whatever the artist planned, it didn't quite work. Of course, the bottle shattered, wheels spun, uh, colored smoke, etc. came about, about uh, out of that. The machine, um, uh, uh, various components of the machine actually crashed and made, created such noise uh, atop of a piano and creating a, uh, creating a kind of very uh, uh, unusual soundtrack. But when sparks escalated into frames and the portion of the machine broke away, crashing into the NCB camera crew, so it actually kind of went beyond the control of the artist. <laughs> the nervous uh, firefighter intervened and doused the machine with water, sealing its uh, fate. So, <laughs> I mean, it didn't trust me. No, the intention of the artist on one hand, the construction with painful kind of putting together of the collage, then it fails. <laughs> it's very interesting, right? To work in the kind of, you are the authority, right? You, have the, you are the artist, right? You have the authority to control it, how it should be. So, um, um, that is why we can say that Mr. Tengulis' uh, self-destructive uh, sculpture had failed and thereby, in a sense, it succeeded. Why it is succeeded? Because it's, it's supposed to fail. All failures are not really uh, unimportant, you know. Failures are actually the best lessons. Maybe for improving ourselves, maybe for making something more uh, uh, sharply critical, you know. In any case, a failure like this is very educative. And this reminds me to end uh, the presentation with Soman's uh, experience in uh, our own uh, great uh, uh, secretariat. Uh, if I will interpret the work in any way, which he created, got dismantled, destroyed, etc., etc., uh, would be from this perspective. I'm very happy that so many, my old friend is here, um, uh, that we could discuss this further, that it is not that necessary that all art should sit, sit in MoMA, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York, or even in Delhi, gallery of modern art, not even in Lalit Kala, you know. Artists that with the, I would understand that would communicate something to its public, to its, you know, people, right, whoever is seeing. So these are my mm, views. There is also a bibliography which anybody is interested, I can um, share. Thank you very much for uh, actually very few people walked out. When you somebody walks out, you feel that you are not doing well. <laughs> but they must have gone for some other work or something. Uh, thank you very much for your all of you are listening very carefully, I could see. Uh, I'm sure there would be some questions. We can take some questions because hmm? Yeah. We can keep it for coming sessions also because this is not going to end here. <laughs> Somebody would like to start the questions?
I was threatened yesterday. Ah. Even threatening happened. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sir, would you uh, say, I mean, can one see post-humanism as a criticality of post-modernism? Yeah, sure. Could you elaborate sure, sure, on sure. the same? Because this human-centeredness, you know, that was the um, anthropocentric, anthropocentrism, was the center of uh, Renaissance and also modernism. Like all that we imagined as uh, liberational, you know, making new, large uh, political change like communism, socialism. So everything was human-centered, you know. So that has somewhat gone in the sense. Now we are actually a little more impersonal. When you say impersonal, it doesn't mean that non-subjective. But uh, we can look at things in a little more angular way, a little more tan tangential way, you know, that everything has, need not be, because we, we realize the possibility of talking from somebody else's perspective. You know, uh, understanding certain other perspectives, etc., etc. So we talk about ecology, for instance, today. No, that is not a kind of human-centric approach, you know, humanism that we talk about. So, oh, oh, ecological concerns are more about uh, the centrality of uh, nature, you know, isn't it? So, it has its value. That doesn't actually cancel out anything what you say, humanism, right? I mean, in Malayalam, we say manishattam. No? That doesn't go from human being. Okay? But that whole centrality of that, that hope of human beings as, you know, re kind of gods, modernists, modern men, as, you know, kind of changing the world and progressing the world and leveling out all the differences and equality and all that. That belief in progress has gone in that kind of notion about human being you know the modern man was a kind of very powerful man who believed in science now today people there are a large number of people who doubt science no that doesn't give it a counter question that you will reject science it's not like that but then there is a way of using something that is not harming environment or the others. So the kind of mindless, late capitalist, you know, rush of human-centered progress, you know. And Kerala itself is a witness of that uh, monorail or something, rail, you know, that may destroy lots of environmental. So people are talking about, talking from the perspective. It's not only our benefit that we are talking, but it's also the destruction that causes much larger destruction, that's of concern. So that perspective we came, we came today, but a lot of people are still not listening. You know, huge dams, we were against huge dams, Narmada, we all kind of shouted slogans, but then it couldn't be stopped. So many people are, um, uh, you know, displaced, uh, uh, so much, uh, Landscape has been lost, nature has been lost. Uh, for what? For Modi to have his uh, Narmada, uh, sorry, Sabarmati, you know, water pool there. It's almost like an urban, uh, the, 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 Narma, so the, the, the Sabarmati river that's supposed to be flowing, it had been drying up every year. That is the fate of most of the North Indian rains and North Indian rivers. Saraswati even dried up, right? Yamuna is almost died, dead. Uh, but uh, to bring water from somewhere and put it as within two bonds, you know, to, to contain it and then give a feeling to the people that you are 
enjoying the river, river front, you know. I mean, that's our regals. No? So, we are still actually waiting that kind of uh, dangers in huge projects like uh, that, you know, like our own Mullapiriyar Dam. Kerala may not exist after some time. You don't know. Impending danger of, uh, of, uh, of uh, human amassing atom bombs and I don't know what all bombs they have now. If this current uh, uh, Russian invasion of, uh, if that triggers off a kind of a third world war, no, everything that we see today may not exist. No? Uh, so it's very dangerous. So in the, the moment you talk about the human power and human centricity, you know, it brings in that dangerous aspect of it. So. Uh, that is, it is in that sense that it is critiqued, post-human. Any other questions? You can also write it down, you can also ask in Malayalam. There's no compulsion, of course. You can also think if you want. You can also talk to me personally, because I'll be coming back in the afternoon to the studios. So any doubts, any questions, uh, we can discuss further. Please say if you have one, otherwise I'll just go and sit. Or shall I sit down here? Visual representation like an appropriation practice and all visual representative representation like an appropriation could do an appropriation of the question. Say it as a question, no, so that I get uh, what you what you have in mind. Visual representation like an appropriation. Uh, what key, no? what key, no? Okay. Visual representation, appropriation. Appropriation is actually um, taking anything from anywhere. Like you can say uh, Picasso using the tribal art and using it is appropriation. So appropriation is uh, using something especially from another class, another community, another, the other, from the other. Without exactly following any norm of correctness, rightness. It's a kind of a colonial, from a modernist perspective, it is a kind of a colonial um, perspective, col colonizing attitude, right? So you appropriate something and make it yours. And like Nandalalbos, for instance, used uh, the folk traditions into decorating Haripura posters, right? So critically looking at it is actually a 
why more, the folk artists were alive? The, they could have been very well, you know, employed for that, right? They would have given a kind of a, but it had to be mediated through a, I don't know, whatever associations you have with Nandalal Bose, from an institution, Stegos, this thing, you know. May not be Gandhi, may not be directly involved, but Kalgo definitely was involved. So that is a kind of a politics of appropriation. But postmodern appropriation is a little more sophisticated, you can say. There also there is a kind of a mindless appropriation of uh, things. I have uh, met with an accident, uh, sorry, uh, artist in uh, accidentally <laughs> in uh, Delhi. In, uh, she was actually kind of uh, buying folk art from Mithula for 50 rupees. They would sell no, this, this big bulk. 50 rupees, 50 rupees. She would bring that in her studio and then overwork on it. Something of the modern art, something of the contemporary, some, something what you see in the city. That image would be overlaid on that. And would sell it for thousands of rupees. And she found no harm in doing it. So there was no sense of collaboration in that. So I'm saying what I'm saying is that in the postmodern times also you have that sense of appropriation. But an appropriation in the collaboration mode. Collaboration mode, like in the case of, uh, uh, say, Navjo Taltaf. I'm giving a rough example. That may not be the perfect example. She goes to the uh, tribal village, lives there, makes a life there, uh, you know, collaborates with the tribal artists, interacts with them, builds things there, also takes them to the gallery, collects money for them, they sell their works and uh, they put their in the banks. So that's another form of, you know, more self-conscious form of appropriation. I think I've made it clear, right? So all appropriations, we wouldn't say is, uh, you know, negative, but that consciousness has come in the context of contemporary politics. Political consciousness, the political consciousness. Appropriation becomes, otherwise any artist can lay hands on anything that is. Like, if I'm an Indian, I can claim Mughal art or uh, Ajanta art as my own, right? The Kerala murals, it's my own, right? But then, even in that, there should be a kind of a politics. There would be a politics, right? I mean, I would see. I'm not going into the details of that at this point. Uh, it's a very good question. What Now, say some artists like Western, modern Western artists, contemporary Western artists like, uh, who is this um, Italian uh, artist? Mm, I forget his name. He's very famous. He was comes to Chennai also. Uh, huh? hmm? Clemente. Clemente, Clemente. He commissions a um, Tamil artist. I don't know their economic uh, this thing. Or an Indian artist would take uh, something from the traditional craftsmen and will transform it like uh, our, uh, I mean, what's his name? Aldu, no, what's his name? What's his name? That Karnataka artist uh, who was in Korea and Japan. Uh, Aldur, no, Nallur. No? Tallur, 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 Tallur. So what responsibility will he have to the traditional artists whose work he has appropriated? Is a question. So often it is not clarified. An artist like uh, 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 Vivan Sudaram has appropriated a lot of artists in there is also uh, here, yeah, so he has also acknowledged them. These people have collaborated or supported me. But then what about if something sells, how he shares the 
profit is not very very clear but creatively he has acknowledged their presence right so various each you have to analyze it in each case there are some sculptors today if they have to carve a big huge uh, stone they will commission some stone carvers right they get their minimal minimum wage only they are not collaborators so they are less just laborers their labor is appropriated there so appropriation is not a one monolithic thing so you have to see it in terms of specific context and specific uh, details all right i think that should be enough uh, thank you all very much for uh, sitting through